This is a video I have been looking forward to for a while. PGP is a major deal in the privacy and security world. It's used in everything from emails to authenticating messages and even encrypting files. PGP is one of the old school forms of encryption and it is still widely used today. So in this video, I am super excited to break it down for you guys and explain what it is, why it matters and how to use it. Stick around because I think this is a video you're not gonna wanna miss. Support for the new oil and all of the various projects we do is brought to you mainly by you guys. That's right, you can support us in a number of ways. And in this video, we're going to focus on the recurring payment methods. These primarily include Patreon, LibrePay, and Open Collective. Now, Open Collective is our personal favorite. It's open source, it's very privacy respecting, and it openly displays all of the money that we make and the money we spend. So it kind of handles financial transparency by default, which is really cool. However, we also accept LibrePay, which is a lot like an open source version of Patreon. And of course, if you are a Patreon user, we have that too. So the choice is entirely yours. If you are looking for a way to support us in an ongoing, very effective fashion, ongoing donations really help a lot. They help us budget, they help us know what we've got coming down the pipeline, and just makes it generally easier for us to plan ahead. That is definitely the best way to help us out. But as always, we have other donation methods, including cryptocurrency, affiliate links, and more that you can find on the website. Every little bit helps, and for those who donate, thank you so much. Let's start off by talking about what PGP is. PGP is a method of asymmetrical encryption. And if you don't know what that means, I made a video all about encryption. I encourage you to go and check that out. PGP stands for pretty good privacy. PGP is mainly used in encrypted emails, but it can be used to encrypt files, authenticate messages, and probably do other things that I don't know about. It's an incredibly versatile piece of technology. PGP was invented in 1991 by Phil Zimmerman as a means to protect activists and their communications back when a time when almost none of the internet was encrypted. For the record, this history that I'm about to give you is incredibly fascinating, but also pretty long. It could be an entire video in and of itself. So I'm just kind of going to give you the spark notes version. I encourage you guys to go and read more on your own. It's again, really interesting. By 1996, PGP had grown so much that Zimmerman founded an entirely new company to manage it. This company was initially acquired by Network Associates Inc., who would go on to be acquired by McAfee, who in turn was acquired by Intel, but PGP itself ended up at Symantec. Ultimately, the folks who worked at PGP Inc. felt like there should be an open source version. They felt kind of weird that they were making such an important technology, but it was all proprietary and pretty much inaccessible to normal everyday users. That feels weird, but I'll allow it. And this is how we ended up with things like OpenPGP, GNU Privacy Guard, and OpenPGP.js. I will be talking about some of those in this video. Again, this is a vastly condensed version. I recommend at least checking out the Wikipedia page. Personally, I found it a very fascinating story. So why does this matter? Well, to be frank, it might not. You don't really have to know anything about PGP to be able to safely use tools like encrypted email, encrypted messaging, or encrypting your devices. And this is a good thing. I think it's amazing that we live in a time where you don't have to understand how ProtonMail works to know that it protects your inbox. Having said that, I do think it's healthy to have at least a basic understanding of how this stuff works. So if I were you, I would at least watch up until the tutorial section of this video. For the record, I feel this way about a lot of things. If you have a basic understanding of how your car works, you're probably not gonna get ripped off by a mechanic. And you'd be surprised how many really expensive repairs you can do yourself for like less than a hundred bucks in parts and an hour of labor. Same thing with computers. If you understand how a computer works, you can make better decisions on how to protect yourself, how to customize it, or pretty much anything else. Knowledge really is power. So while many of you may walk away from this video saying, I am not going to mess with PGP, I still think it's a pretty cool idea for you guys to understand how it works so that you understand how to protect yourselves. Because again, it is still widely in use. There's not a whole lot of other things from 1991 that we're still using these days, but PGP is one of them. How everywhere is it exactly, Nate? Anyways, it's really everywhere. I mentioned in my email video that every single provider, with the exception of Tutanota, used PGP. It's even used by governments. So again, not to put too fine a point on it, but this stuff is everywhere. And in my opinion, it's worth knowing a little bit about. Okay, so how does PGP work? 
Well, for starters, like I said, watch the video about encryption if you haven't yet. That will give you a great basic introduction to it. Like I also mentioned, PGP is asymmetric encryption. So there are two keys. There's a public key and a private key. When you generate these, you can give the public key to anyone you want. That is how they encrypt a message that is meant for you. The private key, however, should be yours and should not be shared with anybody because that is how you decrypt the message. The example that I like to use is writing a letter, which in like 10 years, I'm gonna have to find a new example because who writes letters anymore? At any rate, think of the public key like your mailing address. Putting aside things like doxing and privacy concerns, bear with me. You can give your mailing address to pretty much anybody you want, right? I mean, that's how people send you stuff. What you don't want everybody to have is the key to your mailbox. That is yours and you should not share it with anybody because that's how you ensure that no one else can open the mailbox. Now, for the record, this is not a perfect example. In the real world, anyone can intercept your mail. I mean, it's illegal, but physically nobody can stop them. And the post office has a copy of the mailbox key and, you know, stuff like that. But just generally speaking, think of it like that. The public key is your address. You can let anybody have it. The private key is yours and yours alone, and that's what allows you to decrypt the content. So as I mentioned, there's a ton of encrypted email providers who make PGP very simple. They take the process completely out of your hands and make it automatic. These include people like ProtonMail, StartMail, and many others. But I did mention that there's a way for you to use PGP yourself. So with that, let me go ahead and show you guys how to generate and manage your own keys and use PGP with any email provider, whether or not they offer their own encryption. In these tutorials, I'm only going to show off a few basic commands to get you started, like generating keys and encrypting a message. If you wanna learn some additional stuff, there are plenty of resources online that can help you out. I also wanna note, please do not try to use any of these keys to message me. All of these were made for educational purposes and I did not retain or use any of them. If you wanna use a PGP key to contact me, you can find all of my current valid keys at thenewoil.org slash PGP. Let's start with Linux, because most Linux distros actually come with PGP support built in and ready to start using it out of the box. In this demonstration, I will be using Pop! OS, and if you'd like to know more about why that is, be sure to check out my Linux for Beginners video, which I will link in the show notes. In Linux, we start by opening the terminal and typing the command pgp dash dash full generate key. This is the command to generate a PGP key pair, public and private keys, from scratch. We're given several options here, and I recommend just going with the default option both here and for the key size. Just ignore the fact that I didn't do that in the video. You can also set the keys to expire after a certain time if you know that you're only gonna be using them for a certain time period, or you can set them to be valid indefinitely if you plan to use them until further notice. Next, you will be asked to fill out some identity information. You can put anything you want here. Nobody's going to verify it. This is mainly so that if you decide to upload the key to a public database somewhere, the information will be present to help people search for it and find it easier. But the recipient will also probably see this information too when they get your public key, so keep that in mind. You should, however, use the email address that you're making the key pair for. This will be vital later. You're then asked to create a password or a passphrase, and this will be used to manage the changes to your key, like revoking it, for example. It will then ask you to move your mouse around to generate entropy, kind of like Veracrypt, which I've also done a tutorial on. Once a key has been generated, the easiest way to view it to share it around is to export it into a file. The command to do this is kind of lengthy, so instead of reading it off, I'm just gonna leave a copy in the show notes. In fact, I will be leaving all the commands in the show notes, so feel free to copy them as a cheat sheet to get you started. As you can see, I made some mistakes while doing this, but I decided to keep them in anyway so that you could have more time to see the command being typed out. Sorry about that. I don't really actively manage my PGP keys very often, to be honest. Once the file is exported, it will be present in your home directory and ready to be shared like so. Next, I have created a revocation certificate that can be used to invalidate my current key pair in the event that my keys ever get compromised, or if I simply decide to stop using them. Basically, it just makes them no longer valid. People can't encrypt things and send them to you. Unfortunately, I did not think to show you guys how to actually do this, but again, there are a lot of tutorials online.
Next is importing your keys. When you want to email someone using PGP, you will have to have their public key. In this example, I am importing my own keys that I just made. Again, this is vital so that you can decrypt messages people send you or encrypt messages meant for other people. Speaking of, the next command shows you how to encrypt a message. In this case, I am encrypting the typical hello world message with my newly generated private key. I used my own address for this, but in reality, you would put the email address of the person you are trying to contact. So for example, if I was emailing you, the viewer watching this, I would import your public key in the step that I showed earlier, and then I would put in your email address when encrypting this message. The terminal outputs the encrypted message, and then I have to copy and paste it wherever I want it to go. I could save it to a text file, or I could put it directly in the body of an email, whatever. So now let's assume you've emailed me back. In this case, I will simply be decrypting the message that I made. But again, in a real world example, it works the same way. I copy the message to a text file, I put in the command shown, and then I pick a new file to save the decrypted message to. I could overwrite the existing file with the decrypted version, but I like to err on the side of caution in case I make a mistake. As you can see here, the message is now plain English and ready to read. Again, all of these commands will be in the show notes to get you started. Now let's move on to Mac. Mac and Windows are very easy in the sense that the software to do this is graphical based. There's no command lines, there's no commands to type, just buttons to click, and they're pretty self-explanatory. The drawback is these operating systems don't come preloaded with this stuff. So first we have to go get the software. For this demonstration, I went to GNUPG's website, which is gnupg.org, to pick my software. The first list contains the source code, but if you keep scrolling down, you'll find the ones that are ready to be installed like a normal program. For Mac, we have two options. There's Mac GPG and GNU PG for OS X. In this example, I decided to go with the Mac GPG option, and you can get there by going straight to gpgtools.org. But the other option, the GNU PG for OS X, should work very similarly. You start by downloading the software and installing it just like any other Mac program. When you first run the program, it will ask you to integrate with your stock mail app. That's entirely up to you. If you use the stock mail app, that's probably a pretty good idea to integrate it. If not, probably doesn't matter. If this is your first time running the software, it will also prompt you to create a key pair. Again, this information is not verified, so you can put whatever you want, but you should use the real email address you plan to use these PGP keys with. That will help out later. The other information is to simply help people look up your keys if you ever decide to upload them, or it will show them a display name to easily manage the keys. The program will ask you to create a password. This is used to make sensitive changes to your keys, and then you're done. Right-clicking on the key will give you a number of options, like sending your key to someone, uploading it to a database, revoking the keys, and exporting them. In this tutorial, I decided to export them so that way I can copy and paste them anywhere like I do on my website, for example. It's as easy as clicking the export button and deciding where to save them. Once you open the file with the text editor, you can copy and paste the key anywhere. Now note that by default, these keys will open in the GPG keychain software and that's designed to make it easier on you. You just double click them and they get imported and they're ready to go. So if you want to view the key, you will have to right click it and select the text editor like I did here. Now, unfortunately, I forgot to get some screen grabs on Mac of creating a new message, but the user interface is very intuitive and self-explanatory. Up at the top, there is a new option. Just click on that and follow the instructions. And the same is true for decrypting messages. Windows works very similar to Mac. The most popular tool for PGP with Windows is called GPG for Win, and you can download it by going to gpg number four win.org. Go ahead and download it, and I encourage you to donate if you're able to and plan to use this software often. It helps the developer keep the software up to date, keeping it safe, and fixing any bugs or vulnerabilities. Once you've downloaded and installed the software, it will appear on your desktop as Cleopatra. On the launch screen, you'll be prompted to either import existing keys or make a new key pair. You'll be prompted to enter your name and email address. Once again, the name can be anything you want. It is only used to look you up if you upload your keys into a public database. The email address should match the email you plan to use the keys with. 
From here, you have a variety of options to manage your keys by right-clicking the identity. You can add an expiration date, revoke the keys, upload them to a database, or export them to share. In this example, I show how to encrypt a new message. I created a text file with the message, then I clicked sign slash encrypt and followed the prompts to import the file, select what public key to use, and encrypt the message. As you can see, the message becomes unreadable. Now, much like Mac OS, if I simply double click an encrypted message, it will automatically open the message in Cleopatra and prompt me to decrypt it. The next tool is a browser plugin called Mailvelope. Now, I didn't actually take any screenshots of this in action. However, their website has a very extensive set of instructions, complete with screenshots and all on how to get started and use it effectively. This is probably your best bet if you plan to use your email on a lot of different devices. For example, maybe you have two different computers and you typically use the browser to open your email and you wanna use PGP on both. Finally, let's give a quick mention to Thunderbird. Thunderbird is a very popular open source email management app. It's kind of like Outlook or Apple's built-in mail app. Ever since version 78, Thunderbird has its own built-in PGP integration. You start simply by going to your account settings and clicking on the end-to-end -end encryption tab. From here, you can open the key manager and under file, you will have the option to import existing keys. You can also generate new keys under generate. Thunderbird gives you options like how long the key should be valid for and what algorithm to use. The default is okay to use, even though I did not in this example. Once the key is added, you'll have the options at your disposal to encrypt or sign messages when you go to send them. And you can also import other people's public keys through the OpenPGP manager to make this process easier. A quick note, I do not recommend checking the default option to attach your public key to every message. This goes for any PGP service like ProtonMail as well, for example. In the past, when I've done this, the attachment frequently gets flagged as spam by the recipient's email provider and goes straight to the spam box and they never see it. Instead, I recommend just asking people if they know what PGP is, trading keys with them, or what I do, I just attach my public key as a signature to every message. It's a little bit long and confusing, but it has actually sparked conversations in the past. So now that I've shown you guys how to use PGP, I do want to explain why I don't think you should use PGP with an existing provider like Google or Yahoo. I mentioned that in the last video. To put it simply, I have two reasons for thinking this. Number one, PGP does not encrypt metadata. And for the record, this also goes for like Proton, Tutanota, things like that. So this is worth having in your head. PGP cannot encrypt things like subject line, to, from, date, time. PGP does encrypt attachments, but it doesn't encrypt things like size. So they'll still know that you're sending an attachment. For most people, this is not a problem, but it is something that you need to be aware of. For example, if you are a political activist and you send a PGP encrypted email to a controversial figure in that political community, they're gonna know that you emailed that person. They might not see your content. They're not gonna know whether you're volunteering to help him out with something or saying that that person should quit and stop doing things to put it nicely. They don't know, but they still know you contacted that person and you should go see my metadata video for why that matters. The second reason I don't recommend using PGP with an existing provider is the fact that you cannot encrypt incoming messages before they enter your inbox. Let's say that I'm using Gmail. Shame. If you send me a PGP encrypted message, it will be encrypted in my Google inbox, only I can decrypt it. However, when my bank sends me a balance notification or when my mom, who is definitely not going to learn how to use PGP, sends me an email, it's going to be in plain text and Google has access to that. The number of things that I can encrypt with PGP is actually very minimal. This is another reason I think people should go ahead and use encrypted providers. At least your entire inbox will be encrypted. Now, as I mentioned in that video, you're kind of only getting half of the communication, but half is better than none in my opinion. Once again, I wanna remind you guys that you can help support the new oil and help me keep making more videos like this. Recurring donations are the best way to keep us going. It gives us the most stability and the best capability of planning ahead. Our preferred platform is Open Collective. Again, it pretty much handles the financial transparency thing automatically. However, you can still use Patreon if you are already a Patreon user, or if you want something a little more privacy protecting, there is LibrePay. And as far as the financial transparency thing goes, don't worry, we will calculate how much money we've made and publish that every year like we always do. 
But if you can protect your privacy a little bit in the process of donating, I always encourage you to do so. On that note, if you don't want to use any of those, we also accept a myriad of cryptocurrencies and we have affiliate links where we get a little bit of a kickback if you sign up using our link. So be sure to check those out. Every little bit helps. Hopefully this video has given you a good understanding of how PGP works and has made you feel comfortable with the idea of delving into it yourself. If you don't want to, that's totally fine. I, I respect that. I don't really mess with PGP much myself, to be totally honest, but hopefully you are now at least comfortable with it and you understand how it works, what it can and can't do, because it's really important to not only know how something helps you, but also what the limitations are. If you want to learn more about PGP, this video is probably about as in-depth as I'm going to go. I do have a small section on my website all about it, but feel free to take the things that I have discussed in this video and go research them more in depth yourself. And as always, feel free to join one of our communities to ask questions and get more involved. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.